Okay. Right. We're ready to go. Right. Good evening, everyone. We are really pleased that you could join us for the first evening event of the CEA Winter Program. We are especially delighted to welcome Mike Levy back to Wimbledon for what I'm sure will be another riveting talk. Mike's primary area of interest, research and expertise is the Holocaust and in particular, the kinder transport as can be attested by his new book, Get the Children Out, Unsung Heroes of the Kinder Transport, recently published by Lemon Soul. You'll find details in the chat. And by those of you who also attended his talk last March. A researcher is always coming across things that spark an interest, no matter how remote they may seem from the original subject. This may have been how Mike came across the Jewish jazz man from the Gulag. Perhaps he'll tell us how he made the discovery. There will be a brief time for Q&A. So if you have any question, please put them in the chat and Mike will answer your question after his talk. Over to you, Mike. Thank you very much, Paula. It's great to be back uh, with, uh, with our Wimbledon Hevra. Nice to see you all. Um, I'm sorry the background is a little bit blurred. Um, that's something to do with my eyesight, I think. It's what I see when I have to take my glasses off. So I thought I'd share that with you all uh, tonight. Um, as Paula rightly says, um, there, there is there's something of the researcher, I think, in me, uh, probably always, always has been, uh, but um, the, 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 piece of, the part of the research I really enjoy is the chance discovery, you know, like a, like a detective might find a clue and then find there's a whole trail to something really very interesting that one didn't know anything about. Um, the, tonight's subject, uh, Eddie Rosner, the jazz musician from the Gulag, jazz trumpeter from the Gulag, somebody I, I suspect I'm sharing this with you, with the people out there, someone of whom I'd never heard. And it was only about three years ago, maybe no more than that, that his name cropped up in a conversation I had with a very good friend of mine uh, called Pavel Rogola, uh, or Rogola. Pavel is a citizen of Krakow in Poland. And I go to Poland quite a lot. I did go to Poland quite a lot on various Auschwitz and Holocaust education uh, works. Pavel is uh, not Jewish, but he's very interested in all things Jewish, particularly Jewish uh, in relation to Polish history and particularly pre-war Polish history, you know, before uh, the great tragedy of, of the Shoah. And he mentioned, Pavel does speak like this. He says, Mike, surely you'll know Eddie Rosner, big name, yes? I said, no, never heard of him. And he looked at me in a very disparaging way. He's only a man in his thirties, by the way. Uh, how could anyone not have heard about Eddie Rosner? He said, everybody in Poland who is interested in music, and particularly popular music, knows Eddie Rosner's name. So I began to be quite intrigued by a, a name that meant nothing to me at all. And particularly when I discovered that Rosner was a, a towering figure of jazz or big band sound, we could say, uh, in Europe, and particularly beginning, as you'll see, the whole story, in Germany and Poland before the war, um, and um, has generally been forgotten. But the other important thing about him, from my point of view, was that he was a Jew. He was Jewish and uh, in many ways suffered from his Jewish background. So that led me on to looking for some material or some reading that I could uh, look at about Eddie Rosner. Lo and behold, I discovered uh, something that shouldn't amaze me anymore, that there was actually very, very little about, about his life, uh, particularly in English. There were some books in Polish, which I don't read, and also in German, which I also don't read. I want to be fair to all languages and don't know any of them. Um, uh, I'm going to tell you a bit more about his life from what I've gathered from asking friends to translate bits and pieces. 
and the odd bit of piece on, on Google and so on. But um, when I started looking at the, the life, which was it seemed to me to be not very well documented, I came across a reference in British Film Institute catalog that a film documentary had been made on the life of Eddie, Eddie Rosner, the Jewish jazz musician of the 1920s and 30s, um, and made in the late 90s. Well, I went on a complete wild goose chase trying to find uh, a copy of this documentary film. Um, I think as anyone that's interested in research knows, uh, kind of obsessive nature is quite useful because you don't give up easily. And I tried everything and BFI said, they had a copy, but they don't have a copy anymore. Why don't you try the British Library? The li library says, yes, we've got it in our catalogue, but we don't seem to have it anymore. And everywhere I looked, I went to America, to the American uh, various Library of Congress, said they had a copy, but no, they didn't. Uh, in Israel, they said they had, had a copy, but no. Poland, no. Um, so I was about to give up when a acquaintance of mine, I'll put it no stronger than that, from the BBC said, well, I think the programme might be in the BBC, uh, in the bowels of the BBC basement somewhere, you know, hidden away and never been seen since it was first shown in the late 90s. And uh, that person uh, managed to procure me a copy. And so rather than tell the whole story myself, I'm going to show you an excerpt, a long excerpt uh, from the film, which I think tells the story better than any of us could possibly do. But before I get onto that, I'm going to, let me just uh, make sure I can share my screen. I'm gonna give you a little bit of an introductory background to Rosner uh, by looking at my PowerPoint, which hopefully has come on screen. Just put your thumbs up if you can see that. Yep, you can, well done. So we're looking here at Adolf or Addy or Eddie Rosner. He was born Adolf Rosner in 1910, uh, actually born in uh, Berlin, uh, from Polish parents. Uh, Germany, Greater Germany certainly had possibly hundreds of thousands of Polish emigres who'd gone to live in Germany during and after the First World War. And he was, uh, before I should say, and after the First World War, and he was born there. Now you can see him uh, characteristically dressed in his white suit. He always seemed to wear a white suit, immaculately trimmed moustache, uh, trumpet aloft, and um, you'll see many images of him looking like that uh, in the film, as we'll see a bit later. On the right hand side of your screen is an invitation um, to a special event in which Adi Rosner was going to be the main attraction. And the dates are quite interesting. Uh, for those of you who don't know your Polish months, I imagine most of you do, but if those of you who don't know your Polish months, this is, it says, from the 1st of November, 1937. Lord knows why Listopada is the Polish for November, but it is. So from the 1st of November, 1937, the, the opening of the uh, um, a local um, representation, it means, or local um, event uh, in the town, in the city of Lodz or Łódź. Uh, and this was a, an invitation to come to the opening of a, a nightclub called the Casanova, in which Eddie Rosner was not only going to be the star event, but he was the owner of the nightclub. It was his dream, as you'll see in the film, to own his own jazz club. And in the city of Lodge in 1937, just two years before the outbreak of war and you know, the, the, the destruction, the beginning of the destruction, of the Jewish population of Poland, we have a nightclub opened by a Jew, and many of the musicians were Jewish, a lot of the clientele were Jewish. In this major city of Łódź, Łódź which of course now we kind of only remember it uh, being the Łódź or Lodge ghetto. But before it was a ghetto, it was a very thriving city. It was known as the Manchester of Poland. It's because the textile industry of the country was, was based in uh, lodge and virtually all of the major factories were owned by Jewish business people. And so that's why it would be perfectly natural for Rosner to open his nightclub in the city of Lodge. Uh, now let's see if I can move on to the next one. Now uh, remember I said that I found it very difficult to find anything on 
um, uh, Rosner, the only thing I could find was a biography written in German, and you can see it here, published in about 2004, and the German says, from Hitler exiled, from Stalin punished. And you'll see from the film, here was a man that found himself caught between uh, Hitler on the one part of Europe and Stalin on the other, very much part of um, uh, European history at its most tragic. And my story today is not a tragic story from the Holocaust viewpoint, as you'll see, it's a tragic story from the Russian Stalinist uh, viewpoint. And not all tragic as well, lots of laughs as well, I hope. Well, let me just begin by showing you this photograph. You may not recognize the face, but the name will certainly be very, very familiar. This is Cole Porter, the great uh, non-Jewish singer, uh, <laughs> songwriter, not singer at all. He was a songwriter. And I'm showing you this um, uh, photograph because he did, a, uh, on one of his tours of Europe in late 1930s, 37, he made a special beeline to Poland because he wanted to visit, guess what, the club Casanova and meet one of his idols, the trumpeter, Eddie Rosner. And they met and apparently got on very well. So that kind of shows you the level in which Rosner was known in America that Cole Porter makes a special detour on his European tour to come and see Rosner um, in, in Poland. And there you can see the, the program uh, that he come to see, the attraction, the program attraction, Eddie Rosner uh, at the, um, at the uh, Casanova. Actually, this is now in Krakow because he, he opened two nightclubs, one in uh, Lodge and then one in Krakow because he did very well. And you notice he's holding two trumpets, which is an uh, important part of the story. We'll come on to later. And um, that's what the Hotel Casanova looks like today. Um, it's, uh, I think it's just an arcade of shops uh, in which uh, his memory has been, like all memories, I guess, have been completely expunged. One of the reasons, I'm not particularly, I should say, a jazz fan, but one of the reasons I wanted to find out more about Rosner is because to me, he represents uh, a whole lost generation of Jewish cultural life before the war. He was part of uh, a huge, um, I wouldn't say movement, but a huge panorama of Jewish music, of art, which I'm sure um, Andrew knows all about, um, of uh, ballet, of theater, literature, and so on which was flourishing certainly in the 1920s to about the mid uh, 1930s. So 1937, you know, things are starting to turn from 37 onwards. But he was part of a lost generation of very well known, sometimes internationally known names that because of the Holocaust and the war and so on have been sort of erased from history. Um, I, just before you came on, I just played a little snatch of the Emperor Waltz arranged by Eddie Rosner because he was not only a trumpeter, he had his own band and he was a very keen composer and arranger. And two, of, two or three of his uh, songs became international hits. The, uh, you'll see in the film, you'll actually see him and his band playing uh, Johann Strauss's Emperor Waltz in a version that you never thought you would hear kind of jazzed up version of the Emperor Waltz. Um, and he was also uh, famous in the 30s for uh, arranging uh, the song Car Caravan, which again, I played a little bit of just before we began, song by Duke Ellington, uh, arranged by, by Rosner. Ellington and Rosner were, were very close um, and would have been collaborators in a different uh, history. But you'll, again, you'll see something of that in the film. Uh, another of his famous recordings made in Paris in 38, Barmir Bistouchane. And although it's not in the film, I'll just play a little bit and hopefully you can hear it as well.
Okay, so and that's uh, what <laughs> I haven't got time to play all of it, but uh, yeah, I hope you noticed that the recording company was Columbia, the American recording company. Uh, and again, that shows that he had international status being recorded by uh, one of the world's most foremost recording companies, but also uh, the story about his relationship to Columbia Records comes up in the film. So watch out for that. And as you can see, there's a various set of uh, uh, um, programs showing the kind of strength of music, particularly jazz and nightclub music uh, that was uh, in Poland, for instance, uh, very, uh, very important. And, and nearly all of the music business in Poland before the war was run by Jews. I'm not talking Klezmer here. Klezmer was played, but not as much as we might think. Much more common was big band sound, jazz music. Uh, that was much more popular even among the Jewish population of, of that country. Klezmer's a bit of an American retread, I think, uh, of uh, Jewish culture. It was certainly played, but not in the, not, it wasn't the only sound of Jewish Europe before the war, not by any means. Maybe that's another talk that I'll do some research on and give uh, one day. So um, a very brief bio, and then we'll go and have a look at the film. He's born of um, Jewish, he was born in Berlin, but of Jewish parents from what's now called Os Osvienshem, but in the Austro-Hungarian Empire was known by its Germanic name of Auschwitz. He was actually born in the town of Auschwitz uh, in 1910, where he became a classical trumpet virtuoso. He took up the jazz trumpet, and at the age of only 18, he joined the then incredibly famous German Jewish swing band, the Weintraubs, the Weintraubs, that were known, probably, you know, you can imagine some girl or boy band today, uh, and they were, they were equally well known in the 1930s. And he joined the Weintraubs who toured the USA um, more than once um, as both violinist and trumpeter. You'll see in the film him playing, I think, violin in this case for, for the Weintraub band, Jewish band. Uh, again, part of this very rich culture of Jewish popular music in the 1930s. Eddie was called the White Louis Armstrong. And the person that called him the White Louis Armstrong was Louis Armstrong. Uh, Louis Armstrong called him my brother and regarded uh, Rosner as essentially as being one of the very few people in the world, if not the only one, who was equal to him in terms of skill and uh, feel for jazz music. After the rise of Hitler, Rosner went left Germany to go to what he thought would be a safe country, Poland. First to Krakow, and also we saw Lodge, and then Warsaw. He formed the number one swing band in that country, toured Europe, including Paris, where he made that recording that we just heard of Barmis Bistachane. And he worked with the likes of Maurice Chevalier and Django Reinhardt. So we're talking really about really top notch, top level international musician here. Apparently he learns to speak English like a New York taxi driver. However, I'm not gonna try and do uh, an imitation of that, but uh, people thought that was very funny. And uh, as we saw there, he opens his club the Shayadi or the Casanova in Lodge in 1937. He records for Colombia, as we saw again, which was a big deal for a European musician. Uh, and he plays the sellout concerts in Krakow and Warsaw. And I say, surprisingly, and it is surprising to me, that even today, according to my friend Pavel, uh, people who are interested in jazz in Poland, certainly they, they don't need to be told twice about the name. It's a very still a very resonant and famous name uh, in that country. In, 19, in Warsaw, he meets Ruth Kaminska, who was the daughter of the Yiddish theater's most famous actress, Ida Kaminska, and they married in Warsaw in the spring of 1939. Uh, but of course, the spring of 1939 was very close to the summer of 1939 when Germans invaded uh, Poland. And as you'll see in the film, he manages to escape Poland with Ruth, his wife, and the band members 
and found a kind of refuge on the Soviet side of what was then a divided Poland. He wins favor with the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic, a first secretary Panamarenko, who encourages uh, Eddie to form the uh, USSR's first Belarus state jazz band. He's made an honored artist of the Soviet Union and becomes the highest paid musician in the whole of Stalin and Stalin's USSR. So happy ending? Maybe not. Um, so that's my end of my PowerPoint part of my talk, but I'm now going to just get rid of that and get rid of that. And I need to just do this, sorry. Ah, I'm back. Am I back on with you now? We've stopped sharing, yes, good. So we're now going to have a look at a part of the film which was made in the late 90s, uh, and hopefully you'll be able to see and hear it clearly. It's about 35 minutes, I think, long, but tells us, say, the story. If there are some strange jumps in it, it's because in my ham-fisted way, I've made a few cuts just to keep it down to a playable time. But I think it still makes sense. If it doesn't do right to my agent, my manager rather, and your money will be refunded at the door as you leave tonight. So hopefully, can you see something that looks like a screen? Yeah? Yes. Um, good, and hopefully you'll be able to hear the music. So let's begin uh, the film about Eddie Rosner, the jazz man from the Gulag. Oh, I should say, by the way, just to give you a little bit of context, the English voice you hear is uh, an actor reading lines, li reading the report that a kind of autobiography that Rosner wrote late in life. So the words you'll hear are, are his own words, Rosner's own words. They call me the Tsar back then. You may find that strange, especially for a simple trumpet player, which is what I was. But since you asked me for more information about who I am, let me start by telling you who I used to be in my hour of glory. Because the fact is, I was famous once, even though I'm now reduced to asking you for help. In 1939, circumstances took me to Russia. Although I was a jazz musician, I had no choice but to play easy waltz music to please my new patrons. Even before christening me the Tsar, the Russians dubbed me the Johann Strauss of jazz. father was 19. He was in the United States and that there was some kind of a competition, trumpet players from all over the world and that Armstrong took the first place and my father took the second place. And actually this was one of the reasons that he went later on on, the, on that world tour because it was known, people knew that he was that second young being so young, second trumpet player after Armstrong. I have seen the photograph of Louis Armstrong, which, um, which was inscribed from white Armstrong to black Eddie Rosner. I mean, it meant he wanted to say, you are the same as me. My name is Eddie Rosner. I was born Adolf Rosner in 1910, right here in Berlin, where I'd hoped to enjoy a career as a jazz musician. 
But as you know, in 1939, it didn't help being a Jew and playing Negro music, even if your name was Adolf. No, we didn't have the same sense of rhythm or showmanship. Nor did we share the same taste in music scores. I began my career at home in Berlin in 1928 with the most innovative jazz band of the time, the Weintraub Syncopators. We played real, degenerate music. I even devised a number where I played two trumpets at once. It was our way of mocking the kind of program those smooth talkers wanted to impose on us. They didn't much appreciate our act. From 1928 to 34, we enjoyed a great deal of success touring around Europe. We even got as far as New York. But our country, saying that it corrupted healthy minds, would have nothing to do with us and our depraved, degenerate brand of music. As we know, in Europe at the time was very dangerous. So he came to Poland to perform. I know that from here he was supposed to go to London, back to London. But at that time, he, 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 I know that what detained him that he met uh, that he met my mother that's what i always heard and and because uh, my mother did not agree to be with him right away he procrastinated he stayed here too long and the borders were closed and the, and the only way to save uh, themselves was to was to go east i left germany for poland intending to form my first jazz band there that same year in lodz i met ruth kaminska who was to become my wife her mother was the great Yiddish actress Ida Kaminska, daughter of Esther Rachel Kaminska, founder of Warsaw's Yiddish Theater. She was against our marrying. She took a dim view of her actress daughter marrying a simple kletzma, as she used to say. She had little taste for jazz, but my music soon won her over. I found some good musicians and created the Jack Band. Adolf had now become Jack. I managed to persuade Ruth to leave the Lodz Theatre and come with me and my new band to Warsaw. She would sing and dance. I would conduct the orchestra. I was full of projects. The future seemed ours. We were married in May 1939. During the day, we enjoyed the freedom of a couple in love. At night, we played to full houses in the fanciest clubs in Warsaw. The Esplanade and the Adria. It was really unusual to see such a beautiful girl sing and dance for this kind of band. Given our success, we seemed all set for a brilliant career. My ambition was to create the first Polish national jazz orchestra. September the 1st, 1939. Cinemas were showing It's a Wonderful World with James Stewart and Claudette Colbert. Suddenly the bombs began to drop on Warsaw. The roof of the Esplanade Club caved in on us. Ruth and I threw ourselves under the piano. That piano saved our lives. It's not such a wonderful world, but once in a while, it can do you a good turn. The Esplanade lay in ruins. The Jack Band was now a bunch of castaways, homeless and adrift. We couldn't even save the instruments. 
apart from a double bass. But we were safe and ready to start all over again. Forced to flee Poland, dressed in a uniform of a Wehrmacht officer, I managed to get everybody through German lines on October the 15th, 1939. We reached the city of Bialystok, which had been liberated by the Red Army. That's where Panteliemon Ponomarenko, first secretary of the Belarusian Communist Party and a passionate jazz fan, discovered us. He asked me to create a variety music group to be called the Belarusian National Jazz Orchestra under the direction of and starring Eddie Rosner. The premiere was held at the Grand Theatre of Minsk in the spring of 1940. It was our first official recognition. It was during this period that I changed my first name from Adolf to Eddie. After that unforgettable evening, we were invited to Leningrad, then Moscow. People began to know me as Eddie Rosner. Late in 1941, 24 Polish members of my group decided to join General Anders' Polish army. Pantelemon Ponomarenko asked me to form a new ensemble. I scoured all the clubs and salons to find the best musicians. I had my work cut out for me. Lots of men had been called up. Ponomarenko, that man who drank a lot of vodka and was a communist man, had, had a passion in his life. He loved music and he loved jazz. He heard my father when my father just came. He gave him money, he gave him a theater to perform, and he paid for the costumes and everything, and he used to come and listen uh, to that music. So whenever my father was in trouble, usually he, they contact, he contacted, and Ponomarenko was able to help him. Ponomarenko even had a special train put at our disposal to house the entire orchestra. We called it our home on wheels. The first secretary entrusted me with a very unusual mission, to give jazz concerts for all the military commands in Belarusia. That's how the St. Louis Blues came to be heard all over the Belarusian Republic. The war couldn't stop our train. Our music had to live despite the carnage. This was my personal war. My trumpet was in the front line against fascism. During 1942, our band traveled the length and breadth of the land, from Armenia to Siberia. We even went as far south as Uzbekistan. General Ampanasenko, commander-in-chief of the Far Eastern Army, personally thanked me for services rendered to the troops at the front. 1943 found us in Kazakhstan. My wife gave birth to our daughter, Erika. That same year, under the patronage of Marshal Rokossovsky, the government conferred on me the title Artist Emeritus of the Belarus Soviet Socialist Republic. So it was thanks to Ponomarenko that my career was launched. I was about to record a number of jazz standards. In no time, I had become the leader of the first jazz band in the USSR. We were so well paid that people began to say that my trumpet was made of gold. They even nicknamed me Golden Trumpet. I remember at school, when I was a child already in school, people were asking me, is it true? that uh, your father has a real gold trumpet. I said, well, yes, it is, it is, you know, it, it's that color. Well, yes, it looks gold because it was that brass color. But then also there were, they even published um, postcards with my father. There were postcards that you can send. And one of the postcards was my father playing two trumpets. It was my father's little trick. People liked it. He came with two trumpets and he played both. Everybody knew it in Russia that he can play two trumpets at the same time. 
So I, as a child, I used to say he has even two. Those trumpets, gold trumpets, not only one. In the spring of 1941, I was given a curious mission, which meant we had to temporarily suspend our armed forces tours without so much as a word as to what was expected of us. I was told to take Ruth and the orchestra to the famous Black Sea Resort of Sochi. After a few days of somewhat enforced leisure, we were suddenly told to get ready to perform. It was late afternoon and we weren't really in shape. The situation was like this, like in a Fellini movie. The director, Rubinchik, looked through a little peephole in the, in the curtain and came to my father's dressing room and said, Eddie Ignatievich, there is nobody there. Nobody in the audience, it is completely empty. So my father said, what is it? I know that, what, what about the tickets? He says, I don't know, it's a strange situation. And suddenly he went, suddenly he came back, he said, we have orders to start and do our best. It is very important, don't pay any attention, just perform. They couldn't understand really what it was. In such secrecy, it was, everything was done, and suddenly there was a phone call, and uh, the director uh, literally got up, said, hello, hello, yes, 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 uh, uh, thank you so much, oh yes, we are happy, yes, I will say it, and he put down the receiver, and then he wiped his forehead, he said, this was, himself, Iosif Bisarivionovich Stalin, who said that he liked it. And he was sitting in the upstairs all alone with his adjutants. He came to see the performance. We had given our all for what we thought was an empty house. But in fact, we had just played for the boss himself, Stalin. We were stunned. But we were told that Stalin had very much appreciated our performance, which meant that we were safe for at least 25 years. This presumed protection was not to last anywhere near that long. Now dependent on the Ministry of Defense, my orchestra settled in Moscow in 1944. My new patron put a suite at the Hotel Moskva at my disposal all the year round just a stone's throw from Red Square. The gates of the Kremlin were open to me, so to speak. I was now a recognized and established orchestra leader. I was to give many private concerts for top government officials. I was referred to as Eddie Rosner, director of Stalin's Jazz Orchestra. The war was over. Russia had crushed fascism. There were huge official celebrations. Stalin honored me with the opportunity of giving a major jazz concert in Gorky Park. That evening, I felt totally convinced that the country had gone through an important change and that jazz had something to do with it. At any rate, I became a new czar that night, one who had put jazz in the seat of power. But just as I reached the pinnacle, my fall was all the more sudden and cruel. The party was over even before it had begun. Появилась статья Елены Грошевой, которая называется называлась "Пошлость на эстраде". Она отмечала, что Эдди Рознер, как трубач, в общем-то, занимается трюкачеством. I was merely a cosmopolitan foreigner and a traitor since I was German. I had become the maestro of Berlin, a peddler of depraved Western music. I was denounced as a purveyor of vulgarity, able to do little more than demonstrate my lung power in a program that would hardly be tolerated in a Western European music hall. The USSR had a campaign of fighting with cosmopolitanism. и вообще с западным влиянием. 
не только в сфере идеологической, но и в сфере искусства. И так вот танцуют ногами, дрыгая, приличия все отбросив прочь. И вместо того, чтобы сидеть над книгою, танцуют вечер, танцуют ночь. Стыдно будет незадачливым модникам после этой сатирической сценки. Тем более, если вспомнить, откуда тянет этот гнилой ветерок. Это кадры заокеанской кинохроники. I was made to understand that my artistic career in the Soviet Union was over. Stalin had suddenly decided to do away with certain liberties allowed during the war. I no longer had any choice, so I decided to return to Lodz with the intention of illegally taking the train for Poland with Ruth and Erika. But the secret police were waiting for us. I was arrested on November the 28th, 1946. On December the 7th, I was transferred from my cell in Lodz to Moscow and summoned to the Kremlin by the Minister of State, Abakumov. He too was a great jazz fan. I had once given a private performance for him. Abakumov advised me to admit to the charges or he wouldn't be able to help me. I wouldn't. How could I have portrayed my country? I was a German citizen of Polish extraction. I refused. I was taken to Lubyanka. There was an expression going around at the time, he who plays jazz today betrays his country tomorrow. So there I was, a traitor. No one would ever play Caravan here again. It was time for other songs. Stalin had even outlawed the very mention of the word jazz. If you refuse, you can write, I'm not guilty, but then I can do nothing for you. We'll be in unknown waters, and it is possible that you will be shot. Think it over. There are many of us who love your trumpet. Plunged into deep depression, ill-treated, starved, separated from my loved ones, I was going to give in and sign whatever they wanted me to. I, Adolf Rosner, foreign spy. They took away my passport, for which the word Jew seemed to leap out. It expired five years ahead of time. I was deported to Khabarovsk. They didn't shoot me. Day after day, they asked me the same questions over and over again about my past in Germany. Yes, in 1928, I joined the Weintraub band. Yes, we toured many European countries. Did you go to America? Yes, during the summer of 1931, we were invited to give concerts on board the German transatlantic steamer at the Hamburg. What about the other Weintraub musicians? They were apolitical. How can you be so sure? That's what I know. Were they Jews? Three out of the six were. What about you? Don't you mean four out of the seven? Ignaty Rosner, shoemaker, born in the village of Auschwitz, Poland, and Rose Lampel, cleaning woman. Both were Polish citizens of Jewish extraction living in Berlin, Germany, at 5 Gorgenkirchstrasse. Who were the other members of your family? My sisters, Erna, born in 1895, Regina, born in 1896, Dora, born in 1900. Marta, born in 1903, and my brother Siegfried, born in 1898. I was the youngest. Your activities in Germany. When I was six, I entered the Stern Music Conservatory. In 1920, I completed my conservatory studies with an honorable mention in violin. 
Why music? I've had a penchant for music since I was four. Violin as well as the trumpet? I don't understand. My uncle thought the trumpet was better than the violin. Your uncle was a major influence on you? Like most uncles. Be more precise. After the Weintraubs in 1934, I decided to form my own jazz ensemble, the Jack Band. With the money I made, I could help out my parents. We were poor. Is music that profitable? I was just starting to be successful. I recorded my first records in Paris for Columbia. The American Columbia? They were trying to make me out to be an American spy. You intended to go to America? No. Do you love your mother? Very much. You must want to see her again before she dies. Yes, I do. She lives in Brazil. Yes. So you did intend to go to America? Nobody was safe. Stalin simply did, decided when somebody was well known or famous, that person was dangerous. And these people were immediately eliminated. I am very happy that my father was not such a good friend of Stalin because he survived. My tours had taken me all over this country, but not to the gulag of Khabarovsk and Magadan, capital of the Kolyma. I first set foot in the Soviet Union in late 1939 for my work and work only. I managed to attract the attention and win the esteem of Soviet audiences. During those eight years, my only crime was to try to disseminate the spirit of jazz all over Russia. I also composed a large number of songs which were sung, and still are sung, all over the world. I know how much my music mattered to the people. Nor did I realize that my reputation had already reached those remote parts. The Tsar, people said, was in exile there, and they were expecting him. The authorities of Khabarovsk were already planning on me to form a new orchestra. So I just cut out quite a bit here about the terrible conditions in the Gulag, purely for time. So Rosner was in prison for seven years, but even there he formed several jazz orchestras and those suffering terrible conditions somehow managed to survive. It was March the 5th, 1953. Stalin was dead. As fate would have it, it was a Jewish holiday, Purim, a day of joy. Some of us wept, others didn't dare laugh, but I was free. I was the mere shadow of my former self, back among the living. No one who hadn't lived through a similar experience can understand the disgust, sadness, despair, and deep bitterness which comes from the feeling of having missed out on life. Ruth had left me. She'd been unable to forgive my relationship with Marina. I was only to see my little Erica again for a short time, much too short, to tell her how much I loved her. Marina had remained in Magadan with our little Irina. All I had left was my trumpet. I wouldn't abandon it, and it wouldn't abandon me. Here I was, back in the same room at the Hotel Moskva, which I had left eight years earlier. It had remained at my disposal. Could I leave Moscow? Try as I did, it was impossible to get a visa. I began to dream of the life I could have had if I'd chosen to go to America instead of Poland. News of my liberation had spread through Moscow. To my surprise, the entire musical community was caught up in a patriotic elan. The Tsar was back. I decided to form a new orchestra. There was nothing that could stop me now. If fate plays with man, man plays the trumpet back at fate.
thanks to people like Boris Matveyev and Leonid Elcheyev, I decided to promote a new kind of music, despite the coolness of the authorities. I felt so cramped in this country. I would have to flee again because after 15 years of applying, I still couldn't get an exit visa. Who hasn't been tempted by the call of foreign lands? The desire to feel truly free someday. Free to go to the dreamed of America. I'd married Galina Chodes in 1956. She was my support during these still difficult times. I had still only been pardoned, not rehabilitated. The main accusation of espionage had been withdrawn, but not that of illegally attempting to leave the country. I was unable to go to America, so America came to me in the person of Benny Goodman, who was giving a one-time only concert in Moscow. Goodman knew about my father, so when he came to Moscow to perform, he asked specifically to, to see Eddie Rosner, and my father came, and they talked about music together and complimented each other. In 1970, uh, I received a phone call in New York uh, from a woman who told me that she was a secretary of um, Duke Ellington. And she said, uh, Mr. Duke Ellington would like to know, is it true? that Eddie Rosner might be coming to the United States from, from uh, Soviet Union. I said, yes, uh, I'm hoping that my father will be, will be able to leave, the, uh, to, leave, uh, to leave Soviet Union, hopefully. And he did leave, but later on in 1973. And she said, because Mr. Ellington said that he cannot wait to see your father again and work together. Unable to leave the country, I threw myself into composing. Once again, fame caressed me. I became one of the most famous Soviet performers of popular music. One of the most celebrated and revered men in Russia. I was the Tsar again. He was wealthy at some time. He was one of ten richest people in Russia. He performed even at the, you know, at the stadiums with over a hundred thousand people who came, especially just to see him. But I know that he always remembered about people who were not so well off, 
members of his orchestra, they used to call, где царь. Уже был, а царь пришел, they always called him that way. Because, as I told you, he was, he was a, an excellent organizer, from what I understand, from what I know. And people, it is, it is strange. I always admired that in him, that he managed to be a friend with his people and people who worked for him and all his families. And yet there was a tremendous respect. And what he, during rehearsals, he was, he ruled completely. He was a real, a real tyrant. I devoted myself to film music. I was even asked to act. My acting career was limited to one brief appearance in a minor film in which I played a German officer. It was an historical irony. I had disguised myself in the same costume to get Ruth and her mother, Ida, out of Nazi-occupied Poland in 1939. Despite everything I'd been through, I missed Germany terribly. I decided that I was going to see Berlin again at whatever cost. Maybe I could pick up the career I'd begun there years before. But what was Berlin like now? Berlin partitioned, cut in two, was no longer the Berlin of my birth, my childhood, where, when I wasn't taking violin lessons, I played soldiers. It was my daughter, Erica, who wrote to President Nixon in 1972. Nixon was planning a state visit to the USSR. She received a reply to her letter stating, Your father, Eddie Rosner, will be included in the list which will be submitted to Soviet authorities. After more than 33 years, I was at last about to see my homeland again. The Soviet authorities had already done all they could to expunge my name from history. The Minister of Culture immediately issued an order to cancel my recording contracts, demagnetize my recordings and strip me of my possessions. No trace of my existence was to remain. This explains why I arrived here in Berlin without a single official document which would allow me to obtain a pension here in Germany. You also refuse to pay me the compensation I'm entitled to as a victim of Nazism. My wife Galina and I have been living here in Berlin for three years now in very difficult conditions. My wife insisted that I start working on a recording project, but I couldn't. I no longer have the heart for it. No one wants my music here. Whereas back there, I composed some of the most famous songs in the repertoire. Yes, despite what I have suffered back there, I was the one who brought the good times. All I can do here is to appeal to you, again and again, by insisting how badly I need this support if I am to survive and try to form a new orchestra. You also ask me for more details about who I am. This short biography should suffice to convince you of the validity of my case. Help me. If you don't, I have only God to pray to. I now put down my pen to await your reply, which I hope will be favorable. I sign as Adolf, Adi, Edi Ignatievich, or Pinchas Ben Itzchok Rosno. I think I've had as many names as countries I've lived in. Berlin, February 10th, 1976.
If you wonder why I'm near you, even though I've been denied, I'm inclined to be a little on the sentimental side. I suppose I should forget you if I hadn't lots of pride. But I guess I can have been on the sentimental side. Well, I hope you enjoyed that film. Um, I've seen it, it must be about 10 times now, and I, I'm, I'm gripped every time I see it. But um, as you saw, uh, Rosner died in obscurity and poverty in uh, Berlin in 1976, the day before he received news from the German government that he was in fact entitled to a pension that would help him to live out his last years. But sadly, he didn't know that when he passed away. So I hope that's given you a I think it's a brilliant film, by the way. It's given you a broad sweep of this remarkable character who, I suppose, like many other thousands of remarkable Jewish characters whose name has generally been forgotten. But um, I hope you enjoy that and you've learned a lot about this character, the, the man with the golden trumpet. So I'm happy now to take a few questions, probably not many because we're running out of time, but let's see what we come up with. I've unmuted myself, is that okay? okay? Um, I'm sort of struck. I, I find it very hard to believe that Stalin was interested in jazz. You know, that strikes me as being odd. Oh, well, I can't, I, I'm, not, I'm not the one to contradict you on that, but um, apparently he was and uh, he was, I mean, he was a peasant at heart in a sense, wasn't he? He wasn't a highbrow um, person, although he liked classical music as well, if you believe the death of Stalin in the film. Um, but by all accounts, that was true. So I agree, it's surprising. It's surprising yeah. he liked any kind of art, to be honest. Yeah. Sorry, mm -hmm. another question there from... Just a big mic. Hello, Michael. Michael Brown, nice to see you again. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, OK. Uh, just to mention that I looked up in my little uh, library and found uh, uh, I've got a book called Jazz Jews, which is by somebody called uh, Michael Gelber. And in it, there are several references to uh, Al or Adi Rosner, so oh, it's good. quite interesting. Yes, that he's included in the. Oh, well, that's nice to know. Jazz Jews. Yeah, yeah. I'll put it on my Hanukkah list. <laughs> <laughs> if there are no questions, then um, thank you, Mike, Claudia. Yes, Mike, I'd like to, this was my second time hearing your talk and seeing the film and um, oh. it was just as wonderful this time and such an inspiring man he was, I mean, a, an indomitable spirit um, forming bands everywhere, uh, forming bands in the gulag and, um, and actually it's great to know that uh, Stalin was unsuccessful in expunging his name and um, his memory and uh, yes great inspiring film actually and story so thank you very much Mike and um, uh, could everyone join me in uh, showing their appreciation to Mike with a bit of applause thank you and do look up some Eddie Rosner um, YouTube uh, mm. recordings, which you can hear his music, because I think that's the best tribute mm. we can pay to a man who, as you saw, indomitable, never to be put down, um, 
bouncing back every time and kind of a, a wonderful spirit. So listen to his music as well, as, as I think as a, you'll not just be 